All right, welcome all and Wagwan from Jamaica. Uh, uh, welcome to our fourth installment of the new ASJ webinar series, highlighting thematic research in archeology span and related disciplines from Jamaica and the wider Caribbean. Uh, my name is Dr. Zachary Beyer. I'm the archeologist at the UE Mona, I'm a board member for the Jamaica National Heritage Trust and current president of the Archeological Society of Jamaica. I'll be in charge of moderating today's session along with uh, our other executive members of the ASJ board. <clears throat> Look, this installment is particularly special as it will serve as our, our 19th symposium. These are generally in-person events, but since last March, uh, obviously the world has changed very much. Uh, so we have shifted virtual. This is our first ever virtual symposium. Uh, and we're gonna highlight an exciting and pressing topic during the webinar portion, and then conclude with our annual general meeting, approximately one to 2 p.m. Where, we're, where as the current president, I'll be charged with presenting our executive committee report. Uh, we will also have a very special uh, session uh, honoring uh, uh, individuals with honorary memberships for Archeological Society of Jamaica, including Professor uh, e. Kofi Agorsa and Dr. Philip Allsworth Jones, and and welcome, welcome Philip to today's session. Thank you so much for your for your attendance and your support, and thank you all for joining us for another dis discussion of new insights and perspectives to understanding the past, engaging the present, and planning for the future. Before I I, I continue, I really want to extend my my sincere thanks to all uh, the current members of the AG, uh, ASJ board who have, who have made this virtual event possible. Uh, we've had two events in the last two months, uh, which for people with full-time jobs, doing, doing uh, other, a range of other activities, again, during a pandemic uh, has, has required a lot of time and energy. And I'm just so thankful to have uh, the team uh, together uh, that, we've, that we've had this full year. So today's webinar will focus on recent advances in DNA science that have opened up new possibilities for understanding the human past uh, beyond archeological and historical evidence alone. Over the last decade, a DNA revolution has significantly contributed to the work of archeologists across the globe, similar to the revolutionary effects of radiocarbon dating in the mid 20th century. This work also raises a whole new set of ethical concerns that require advanced and collaborative approaches. Problems including uh, destructive analysis of human remains, certain interpretive problems, how to integrate uh, DNA evidence uh, with existing lines of evidence without privileging uh, the DNA ev evidence alone. Uh, something that in a recent article by Elizabeth Sawchunk, a bioarchaeologist at the University of Alberta, referred to as molecular chauvinism. Uh, and we're also dealing with problems with the potential disconnect between native indigenous communities and researchers, as well as the implications for contemporary beliefs of, 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 of native indigenous populations. Uh, and I, I have a feeling uh, presenters today will highlight how they're involving uh, uh, a variety of native peoples in, in their research. So in the Caribbean, studies of DNA have revealed significant insights into the complex patterns of migration, interaction, and transformation that have shaped this region throughout its prehistory and, and even more recent history. Uh, so our AGM webinar today aims to provide an overview of this recent work uh, that has shed new light on the human past and contemporary cultures uh, in the region. Our exciting group of panelists today will highlight their different approaches to DNA analysis and studies of the Caribbean past and present around a set of key questions, including what do studies of ancient and contemporary DNA reveal about the biological histories of Caribbean people? How do the results from DNA studies compare with understandings from history and archaeology? And what does the future hold for further DNA research in Jamaica and the wider Caribbean? Now, you all know I like, I like to talk, but let me just talk a little bit about our presenters today. It's a really great opportunity to, to bring them together for this discussion. 
their both of their work uh, has been already valuable and likely they will make uh, continued contributions to the Caribbean story and the future of DNA science. Uh, I just met Dr. Uh, ben Torres, but prior to this, I had the opportunity to meet one of her co-authors, Harcourt Fuller, during his 2018 research trip to Jamaica, where he examined material culture and excavation records from uh, Professor Kofi Agors's work at Nannytown and Akampong. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about this imaginative and multidisciplinary work along, along with Dr. Ben Torres's other uh, research projects. Now, Dr. Sirak, I, I first met her and her team during a summer 2020 meeting with First Peoples Indigenous representatives from across the region ahead of their publication of exciting research on Caribbean ADNA. Uh, I think that was recently released in the international uh, uh, journal Nature. It was an honor to be invited to this meeting and that, that invite came from a board member, uh, 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 Diane Golden, Golden Frankson, uh, Frankson, as well as Kasike Kalan Nebron uh, Ricks Kamen, who are both present today. And this has resulted in the opportunity to apply this approach now to ADNA in Jamaica in what we hope to be a collaborative project bringing together Dr. Sirach and DNA specialists from Harvard and beyond, along with archeologists and collections managers in Jamaica. So we look forward to a fruitful discussion today that will no doubt be informative and likely inspire further training and research of this kind in Jamaica and the wider Caribbean. So that's our webinar. It, the, our webinar will be followed by our annual general meeting, approximately 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, and the schedule begins with the executive committee's annual report. We'll then move to a, a, an important session, uh, honorary memberships to be conferred upon Professor E. Kofi Ugorsa, as well as Dr. Philip Allsworth Jones. We'll then go through our, the, our regular annual business, which uh, uh, primarily our society elections, and then closing remarks uh, from, from the new uh, president. In order to attend the AGM, I just wanna let you all know, you have to be a current member of the ASJ. So please, if you haven't yet, renew your membership today, like right now. Uh, you can do that from the ASJ website, uh, archeologyjamaica.wordpress.com. So before we hit the ground running, just a reminder of some rules of the road for, for the webinar and the AGM. Uh, please feel free to introduce yourself right now in, in, in the chat and provide your affiliation. Uh, during the discussion, leading up to the question and answer, please keep yourself muted. Uh, hold your questions, comments until the end. You can post in the chat or raise your hand and we'll, we'll call upon you. If you're using social media, please use the hashtags ASJWebinar and Archaeology Jamaica. So a final uh, thanks to the ASJ board or from the ASJ board to all our contributors, Dr. Sirach, Dr. Ben Torres, as well as our audience. Before we move into our opening blessing, I'd like to introduce the chair of our session, my friend, Dr. Leslie Gail Atkinson Swaby, who will provide the introduction, conclusion, uh, as well as introduce our panelists as they, as they come up with Dr. Kendra Sirach first, followed by Dr. Uh, ben Torres. Dr. Leslie Gail Atkinson Swaby is currently founder and managing director of Plum Valley Publishing Limited, which specializes in developing heritage resources for children. She is a, a graduate of the UWE, uh, Mona in Jamaica, the University of Glasgow in Scotland, as well as the University of Florida, which I know we have University of Florida representing today. So pleased to have you all. Uh, where she obtained a BA in history and archeology span and MPhil in archeological studies and a PhD in anthropology. Uh, Dr. Atkins, uh, Atkinson Swaby's work experience spans over 20 years during which she has served as an archeologist, researcher, editor, and educator. As an archeologist, uh, uh, Dr. Atkinson Swaby spent over 16 years at the Jamaica National Heritage Trust, the JNHT. We have representatives from the JNHT here as well today. So thank you all. Uh, she served at the JNHT as a senior archeologist research manager 
and an archaeologist. Uh, she has over 15 years of experience as an educator from UE, the Caribbean Maritime University, as well as Edna Manley College of Visual and Performing Arts, where she's lectured a variety of courses in archaeology, heritage, art history, and research methodologies. Her research specifically focuses on the Taino, as well as African Jamaican archaeology, rock art, cultural context studies, food and culture, and ceramic analyses. The Caribbean is her regional focus, as she is very interested in and dedicated to studies of colonization, human adaptation, and cultural contact within the island environment. Dr. Atkinson Swaby has written several publications on Jamaican archaeology and rock art. In addition, she's the editor of The Earliest Inhabitants, The Dynamics of the Jamaican Taino, published in 2006, as well as the co-editor of Rock Art of the Caribbean, uh, and, and recently published, and this is quite exciting, her first children's book, Boyania, uh, I'm sorry, Leslie, for butchering that, a, Taino's, a Taino Girl's First Adventure that was released in 2019. And I, I didn't say it here, but Leslie has been a long-standing member, a former president of the Archaeological Society of Jamaica, actively involved also with the, the editing and release of, of, of prior versions of Archaeology Jamaica, which we, we, which we hope to get her back in and, and assisting us uh, more. With that said now, I welcome Kasike Kalan Nebronrix Cayman, Jamaica's chief of the Jamaican hum, uh, hummingbird Taino tribe. And, and uh, the Kasike will provide us with an opening prayer honoring our Taino ancestry uh, and, and, and the Jamaican past, uh, but, but also Jamaica's present. Uh, uh, the Kasike will be followed by Dr. Leslie uh, Gail Atkinson Swaby, our chair, who will offer her opening remarks. Uh, as well as concluding remarks ahead of ahead of the question and answer. So, Kasike, I now I now welcome you uh, to to take the lead for us. Usalukali, good morning, good morning, my relatives. Usalukali da yukunu ni borish kaimandiri kasike yukayeki yame wani daka ikonye wakia yaka wamun woperito. Today we are here to honor those who were before us. Today we are here to honor those who are with us and those who will come after us. This work at this point in time is very beneficial to the community as our relatives from the, the Harvard study could share. There were so many questions that the indigenous descendants of today have as it relates to DNA. There were so many oral traditions and stories that were able to be confirmed and so many spirits lifted. There, there, there are people that were in tears to get that confirmation of what they've known intrinsically for so long. So at this moment, I am filled with joy to have this panel speaking and discussing this topic about Jamaica in the space hosted by Jamaica that as, as so many on this panel that have been a part of the Taino movement for so long know that we have many times been overlooked. So I am so appreciative of our voice being heard and an opportunity to host. I, I, I must thank the Archaeological Society of Jamaica and all of the panelists for taking this time now to do this. As the elders would share that, you know, once one door opens, another will close. And though this pandemic has closed many doors, many windows have been opened and it is for us to make opportunities of these. So it's a true privilege to be here to share with you all. I will do what is called the call of the sacred directions, which in our tradition, it is how we welcome and open this space for that blessing, for that guidance of the ancestors, that blessing, that guidance and honoring of those who are here before us to ground, to be present, to speak in a good way of truth. I will do it in Wahiani, which is an island Arawakan language, which we use now, and I will translate it into English. So, we will start with our attention being focused in the direction of the south, calling in the medicine from the south, then the west, the north, the east, mother earth below us and father sky above us. Wariko, wariko, waria wa bonito, mahaya, auraya, seremain, busikati wa buhuyem. Call from the winds of the south, the medicine of healing. 
the medicine of aura, the turkey vulture, which teaches us to heal, to cleanse, and to clear, to remove the doubt and the fear from our minds. Anhankatu. We turn our intentions to the West. Wariko, wariko, waria, kwaibe, saraya, mukaroya, kaimanya, buyiria, serame, musikatiwa, waribo aniki, waribo anichi. We call from the direction of the West, from the direction of Soraya Kwaibe, the realm of the ancestors, the medicine of courage, of, of bravery, to speak our truth, to be open to listen, to learn, and share. We turn our intentions to the North. Wariko, wariko, waria, albeborael, wahayona, sibao. Yaboya, Wania, Busikatiwa Eita He Eita Ni. From the winds of the north, we call in the medicine of the hummingbird, the medicine of the Yaboa, the night heron. Grant us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Again, to speak our truth, to speak from grounding, to speak with clarity. From the winds of the east, we call upon the the medicine of the Warawao. Wariko, wariko, waria, kasiba agua, warawaoya, chinchilinya, watibiria, usikati wa alakarun, seneko kakona. In the winds of the east, we call upon the medicine, the watibiri or picheri, kingbird, chinchilin or blackbird, the warawao, the red tailed hawk. Grant us vision. Allow us to tap into the abundant blessings that the ancestors have left for us, the, the footsteps they've left for us to follow, so we may learn and teach future generations. From the earth, we call upon the medicine of Atabeira, Mother Earth. Help us to walk softly to be conscious of what we share, and to share from our hearts. Wariko, wariko, waria, yaya, tureba, yukahuba gwa marokoti, hahom munikonye, hahom munikonye. From above, the creator, the provider, yukahuba gwa marokoti, he who provides nourishment, we give thanks for this day and this opportunity to share in this way. Me, our discussions here being a good way, sharing for upliftment of our spirits and those who will hear, those who are called to be present. I thank you all for this moment of honoring those who came before us in such a good way. May you all be blessed for this work that is being done. And hankatu, and so it is. Mabrika, welcome. A special ha home to Kasike Nibon Rish Kaiman, Kasike, and founder of Yukayeke Yamaye Guanai. Of, he is our first installed Kasike in centuries. And he was installed in a beautiful ceremony some two years ago, and I am happy that I was there to witness. Thank you, Kasike, for taking us through the call of the sacred directions and for your blessing. A special welcome to all our guests. Zach kind of put me on the spot because he mentioned um, many of my US professors being here. So I would like to um, mention Professor William Keegan, who is in audience and Professor Susan de France, um, who is also here, who were a part of my PhD committee. So I wouldn't be here without them. Um, special good morning. Special good morning to our special honorees, Dr. Philip Allsworth Jones and um, Professor Gorst. I'm not sure if he's here, but in case he does come uh, during this session. And welcome to all the members and potential members of the Archaeological Society of Jamaica. In this webinar today entitled Our Inheritance, DNA, and the Caribbean Story, we explore the achievements and potential of genetic anthropology. We are featuring the work of two brilliant scientists, and I am even prouder that they are women. Um, 
it's just such an exciting period. And they are scientists in genetic anthropology, um, Dr. Jada Ben Torres and Dr. Kendra Sirak, who are utilizing DNA both from ancient and contemporary populations in answering long standing questions about the indigenous cultures of the Caribbean region. I am going to do the bios based on the order of their presentations. So I am starting with Dr. Kendra Sirak who is a senior staff scientist in the Department of Genetics at Harvard Medical School. She did her postdoctoral fellowship in, ancient, in the ancient DNA lab of Dr. David Wright at Harvard Medical School and Harvard University. She specializes in ancient DNA, anthropological genetics and population history. Her research specializations um, spoke, focuses particularly on using ancient DNA as a tool that is strengthened through integration with anthropology, archaeology, and other lines of evidence to explore population history of groups of people in the past. She was a co-first author of a recent study of the genomic landscape of the pre-contact Caribbean entitled A Genetic History of the Pre-contact Caribbean published in Nature. I think it's December 2020. So if you haven't read it yet, I, I encourage you to have a read. This article reported the largest ancient DNA data set yet for the Americas. Genomes of 263 individuals were studied, and this generated new evidence to test long standing hypotheses about indigenous Caribbean people inspired by decades of archaeological research. She is also extensively involved in the development of minimal invasive techniques for sampling the human skeleton and the articulation of ethical principles for ancient DNA research. Welcome. Dr. Sirak. I now move on to Dr. Jada Ben Torres, who is an associate professor of anthropology and director of lab for the Laboratory of Genetic Anthropology and Biocultural Studies at Vanderbilt University. Her research specializations are genetics, race, genetic ancestry, ancient DNA, human dis health, sorry, health disparities. African descendants and her regional focus is Caribbean. I'm happy to say that her family is from Trinidad and I did say that we were going to claim her as ours because she is Caribbean, right? Dr. Ben Torres primary research area um, is in the Caribbean where she explores genetic ancestry and population history of African indigenous Caribbean peoples. A second emerging area of research for her combines the tools and theories of genetic epidemiology with anthropology in order to holistically examine health disparities. And with regard to that, she especially focuses on um, the prevalence of um, uterine fibroids among women of African descent. And as a, a black woman, I can attest to so many women in the Caribbean who suffer from this condition. Her recent work includes a book she co-authored with Gabrielle A. Torres Colon entitled Genetic Ancestry, Our Stories, Our Past. And um, Dr. Torres Colon is also her husband. So, I mean, she's relationship goes for me because I can't get my husband to read my work, but she can co-author with hers. <laughs> uh, congratulations, Dr. Ben Torres on your book. Um, other publications, noted publications, including the work with Harcourt Fuller that Dr. Bayer mentioned earlier, where she um, highlighted their research on the genetic DNA um, ancestry of the Akompong Maroons um, from St. Elizabeth. Today, she will be exploring the interactions between indigenous Caribbean and African descendants in the region. She is focusing on her most recent work in Puerto Rico among African descendants and their possible indigenous ties, in addition to showcasing her work with the Akampong Maroons. And her pre presentation will demonstrate how genetic anthropology can enhance our understanding of the past and provide additional avenues and questions in archaeological research. Welcome, Dr. Ben Torres. Welcome. All right, so we are going to start 
with Dr. Sirak. Um, each presentation has 20 minutes. Um, ladies, I will, I will use the chat to, to give you five minutes um, for wrap-up notice, so keep your eye for the highlight in the chat. All right, so Dr. Sirak um, will be presenting her paper on ancient DNA and new lens into the pre-contact Caribbean. <clears throat> Can you see my slides okay? Perfect, perfect. Okay, okay. all right. Um, okay, well, thank you so much for that really nice introduction, uh, Leslie and Zach. Um, so I will be talking today about um, a new lens into the pre-contact Caribbean using ancient DNA. Um, so to begin, I want to thank the ancient people who we study and the present day people who identify as having a biological or cultural legacy with them. Um, we worked really closely on this project with Caribbean based colleagues and they were centrally involved in this work. Um, and as Kasike mentioned, we had some we were in contact with community representatives who provided critical feedback and offer local perspectives and really pushed um, us to, to do our due diligence in um, making this paper reflective of, of stakeholder perspectives as well. Um, and I'd like to thank a lot of the other people in my lab and other labs um, who have contributed so much to this. Um, a thanks to Zach um, for inviting me to speak here today. And it's it's really an honor to speak um, alongside uh, Dr. Ben Torres, um, who I, I'm glad I'm going before her and not after her because I think she's probably a very hard act to follow. Um, so today's agenda, I'll talk a little bit about what ancient DNA, DNA is, the previous work we've done, and what comes next. Um, so to begin, what is ancient DNA? Um, it's the study of DNA collected from biological specimens that lived anywhere from hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago. So we move from bones to base pairs when we study DNA, and I'll talk a little bit about the methods that we use to do this. Um, so before we go any further, I want to note that studying uh, human remains demands both respect and sensitivity. Um, it's a privilege to study human remains and we should all proceed in our work with this in mind. Um, so human remains must be treated with respect and dignity. Um, researchers must be open to learning perspectives on what it means to act in the interest of a once living person through communication with identified stakeholder groups. Um, researchers are stewards of biological material that's loaned to them for study. They are not the owners of this biological material. Um, and their rights to it do not extend beyond what is agreed upon uh, by stakeholders as part of a project. Um, an important part of ancient DNA research is that need to engage with other stakeholders to ensure sensitivity to their perspectives. Um, it, it really is the responsibility of those carrying out the work to ensure that stakeholders are identified, that meaningful engagement takes place, and that respect and sensitivity to um, all perspectives are reflected in the output. Um, and, and researchers have a duty to work with relevant stakeholders on outreach efforts that also uh, make the output uh, accessible to, to the non-academic community. Um, so this can involve working with collaborators to translate the abstract and key results of the paper into local languages, uh, developing lesson plans for school curricula, producing pamphlets for local museums or libraries, um, or designing exhibits that feature this research. Um, when possible and appropriate, researchers to contribute to capacity building and training and educational opportunities, um, particularly for underrepresented group. Um, finally, I want to acknowledge that any discrepancies between results from genetic analysis and other lines of evidence are okay and they should be understood as part of the compound nature of knowing the past. So why do we study ancient DNA at all? We use it as a tool for looking at the genomes of people who live in a specific place at a known point in time. So similar to how a microscope allows us to look into a world of microbes invisible to the naked eye, ancient DNA allows us to take a window into the genetic past and enable the analysis of direct variation in, in organisms that have been uh, deceased for a long time. So it enables us to investigate how ancient people are connected to each other and how they relate to people living in the uh, same place today. So the study of ancient DNA is important because humans have not descended from sim in simple ways from the populations that lived in the same place in the past. Um, instead, we have moved throughout the world and we've mixed with each other along the way. 
In addition, we've experienced major demographic upheavals throughout history. And this is one of the reasons that it makes uh, that DNA, the study of ancient DNA in the Caribbean is so important. Since about 500 years ago, um, obviously the cultural and genetic landscape of the Caribbean has changed drastically, first by European colonization and second by the ensuing slave trade. So the people who live there today are not necessarily fully representative of all of those who were there in the past. So ancient DNA helps us to uh, gain a little more insight into um, the people that lived there before these major demographic uh, uh, upheavals took place. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, project that we published, um, as was mentioned in uh, December 2020. Um, <clears throat> the first question we wanted to know was, can we use ancient DNA alongside archaeology to advance and resolve debates? Um, so it's widely supported that there have been multiple waves of people into the Caribbean from the American mainland. But beyond that, pretty much everything is kind of the subject of question and debate. Nearly every part of the Circum-Caribbean area has been put forward as a potential origin for the peopling of the Caribbean. And different lines of evidence point to different places as being the origin, as well as a different number of migrations. So furthermore, the, the trajectory of the spread of people into the Caribbean is also um, unclear, and there's multiple models for how this movement of people occurred. Um, population history in the Caribbean is still primarily spoken about in terms of cultural history. So this is uh, associating people with sequential or sometimes overlapping material cultures. Um, we call it the people versus pots debate, and it's still alive in the Caribbean. Um, and basically what this is, is a debate about whether the spread of different archaeological traditions or the development of new traditions involved demic movement or associated or resulted from cultural diffusion. Um, and ancient DNA can be helpful in, in exploring this debate. So even though ancient DNA seems to be very useful for the Caribbean, before 2020, we had very little um, ancient genome-wide ancient DNA data for people who lived in the Caribbean. So um, in March 2020, we actually only had genome-wide data for three individuals, one from the Bahamas and two from Puerto Rico. Um, this is in comparison to thousands of ancient individuals from places like Eurasia. So very, very underrepresented in the terms of uh, paleogenomic research. Um, in June 2020, a separate study re reported 93 new ancient individuals um, was published from the Caribbean. Um, and you can see here that now we have much better geographic coverage. Um, and it also includes uh, people who lived in both the archaic age time, stone tool using people, as well as the ceramic age time, uh, people who predominantly uh, use ceramic technology. So in our work, we screened 195 ancient individuals for evidence of authentic DNA. Um, 100 74 of them that passed quality control measures for authenticity. We generated 45 new direct radiocarbon dates. I can feel the excitement from the archaeologists here. I know that that's, a, that's a, a big number and it's been really exciting to get to work with those and to understand these, these data in context a little bit too. Um, we actually co-analyzed our new data alongside the data that was published in June 2020. And we made a final data set, which was 263 individuals who lived between 3,100 years ago and 400 years ago. And here you can see the spatial and temporal distribution of this data set. Um, and the figure on the left shows our newly generated data and our co-analyzed data. So you can see that we have a much better coverage um, of the Caribbean now. Um, the figure on the right is just our newly reported data, and it shows the temporal distribution. Here, the thick bars represent radiocarbon dates, and the thin bars represent uh, archaeological context. So now, a main question for us was, how should we group these individuals? Should it be based on archaeological uh, age? Should it be based on geography? Should it be based on a uh, type of uh, uh, material culture at the site? Um, now, we recognize that the groupings um, that, we, that we place on people in the past may or may not reflect their true nature of social organization, um, but this is really important for uh, the analyses that we do as part of this work. So what we did here is grouped individuals using commonly used genetic software to create genetically driven groupings of sites and individuals in a way that was blinded to archaeological based material culture assignments. 
So by grouping individuals just totally based on their genetic data, um, and then asking the extent to which these groupings corresponded to cultural evidence, we were able to ask questions um, in a meaningful way and improve our understanding of the past. So first here, we identified three major clades, and you can see these with the yellow stars. Um, so in these clades, every individual is descended from an ancestral population that's homogenous from this, that's homogenous since the separation between every other clade. That's a mouthful to say. Um, so basically, so these are three broad groupings, um, genetically distinct groupings. Next, we looked at subclades, and you can see these here with the purple stars. So here, within the clades, there were certain sites or individuals that were more genetically similar to some than to others. So these are these uh, subgroupings here, or called our subclades. And finally, we identified two admix groups. So these were from two individuals from Haiti and five individuals from Curacao who had proportions of ancestry from either two different major clades or major subclades. So um, this is how we ended up grouping these individuals for the purpose of our studies and our, fine, our nine final groups are uh, shown here. So I'm gonna discuss two research questions today in the interest of time. The first is what are the geographic origins of the Archaic Age and Ceramic Age migrations into the Caribbean and how many were there? And second, what can we learn about uh, population size and social organization in the ancient Caribbean? So here what you see um, is a PCA on the left and our admixture analysis on the right. Um, now, on the PCA, we see two distinct clusters of individuals. One that I have circled here in red um, is associated with archaic, uh, archaic uh, age sites or sites where uh, stone tools were the predominant technology. Um, we see them here on the admixture plot, mostly characterized by this yellow component of ancestry. Now, the second cluster is circled here in blue, and this is our ceramic associated cluster. And it is um, on the uh, admixture plot as characterized by mostly this teal component of ancestry, which is also um, the main component of ancestry in the Arawak uh, speaking Piapoco people. Um, we have admixed individuals and they fall right within um, kind of on the edge of our ceramic related cluster as expected because that's where they get most of their ancestry from. So we asked if these ancient people were particularly related to any present day group from the continental Americas to help trace the origin of those migrations. Um, so we apply something called F, outgroup F3 analysis to look at this statistically. So what we found here is that our stone tool using archaic age people or people from archaic associated sites share the most genetic drift with indigenous groups from Central America and from South America, but it's there's no real affinity to any particular group or region. In contrast, the ceramic users of the Caribbean um, have a bit more of a specific result. So previous DNA work has pointed to Arawak speaking South American groups as having a genetic affinity to Caribbean ceramic associated people. And this is consistent with the presence of Arawak languages in the Caribbean at the time of European contact and still today. Um, so we actually see attraction um, between the Caribbean ceramic people and people who live um, at around the present day Venezuela and the Guianas where Arawak speaking groups live um, at present. So to answer this first question, we see evidence of two distinct migrations in the Caribbean. The origin of archaic associated people appears to be in a very deeply divergent Native American population that's not really closely related to any present day groups, most likely from Central or South America. But we find a suggested connection between ceramic associated people in the Caribbean and present day Arawak speaking people in Northeastern South America. And this will be presently more precisely resolved with additional data. So our second question is, what can we learn about population size and social organization? So we'll first talk about the second half of this question. And here we look to identify close relatives up to the third or fourth degree in our data set. So here we found um, 57 close kin pairs in our data set. Um, the most of the, those relationships were at the site of La Caleta in the Dominican Republic, where 37 out of 63 individuals um, had a relative, but the proportion was the same as, as some other sites where we just uh, studied less individuals. 
So we identified male relatives who were buried around 75 kilometers apart in the Southern Dominican Republic. And this was really exciting to us because this represents the most widely separated family members yet recorded for the Caribbean. And it provides direct evidence of overland mobility and intra-island connectivity um, during the ceramic age. So um, our second part of this question is what can we learn about population size? Um, what we did is we made cross-site and cross-island estimations of population size by analyzing long shared segments, um, which we call IBD blocks, uh, between the X chromosomes in pairs of males. So these IBD blocks or segments of shared DNA are signatures of recent co-ancestry. So sharing an ancestor in the not so distant past. So we first identified all shared genomic segments on the X chromosome between pairs of males. We measured the length of these shared segments, and then we used what we call a likelihood approach to estimate population size um, from these blocks. So we find that there's an abundance of long shared fragments across people who live on different islands. And this is indicative of population sizes below 10,000 people. Now, effective population size. What this is, is the amount of the, the presently reproducing population. So in order to get census population size, we multiply this number anywhere between by anywhere between three and 10. So this doesn't mean that there were 10,000 people overall. This means that there were more likely a 30 to 100,000 people overall. So specifically, looking at the rate of these shared segments within different length sizes allows us to estimate a, a population size for the, the whole Caribbean, um, which we find to be around an effective population size. So again, that re reduction by tenfold of around 3,000 people um, with this 95% confidence interval between 1,500 and 8,100. Um, so one exciting thing that we found is 19 pairs of individuals who lived on different islands in the ceramic age Caribbean who shared segments of DNA that were at least 8.7 centimorgan, which means that they, sh they shared an ancestor within the past handful of generations. So so um, this suggests that some of the estimates of population size previously are way too large. So population sizes in the pre-Columbian Caribbean were likely smaller than many historical accounts suggest. And the population in the pre-Columbian Caribbean was small, mobile, and highly connected. Um, one thing I want to point out here, that even though we have a smaller estimate of population size, this does not minimize at all the devastating impact of European colonization, the expropriation, and the systematic killing of indigenous people. Um, this was a genocidal event that is not dependent at all on the number of people who uh, experienced it. So finally, what comes next? So first, we'd really like to fill in some of these geographic gaps where we have no ancient DNA data. Um, this includes pretty much all of Northeastern South America, a lot of the Lesser Antilles, um, a lot of Cuba, and of course, Jamaica. Um, we would like to generate new high resolution paleogenomic data that will add to this rich understanding of Jamaican population history get garnered through archaeology, history, and other lines of evidence. Things like oral tradition as well really contribute to our understanding of this. Um, we'd really like to work closely with our Jamaican colleagues to establish collaborations and uh, carry out this work in a way that's equitable and engaged um, and, and make this a great experience for um, all involved. Um, we also really want to make sure that um, we're considerate of stakeholder perspectives um, from a, a diverse range of, of stakeholders. As Kasike mentioned, we, we held an event where we, we talked with um, a bunch of stakeholders from around the Caribbean um, prior to publishing this paper. And I hope that, um, you know, in future work, this becomes something that is a, a key step. And we want to be able to communicate our results to academic academic audiences, as well as to general audiences in accessible ways. Um, so I was going to end with this slide. I know I have just a minute left, um, but 
what what Kasiki said, Kasike said, which was really important, was can we connect the ancestry um, that we found in individuals living in the Caribbean to any ancient de uh, to any ancient groups? So the answer to this question in the study that we published previously was yes. Um, and these are some very kind of unromantic looking charts um, that shows how we did that. Um, it's basically based on some statistics and also. The identification of shared mitochondrial haplogroups, including a brand new haplogroup that we identified in um, ancient in ancient Caribbean individuals and ceramic using groups, as well as in present day um, individuals from Puerto Rico who are in the thousand genomes data set. Um, so this was an important finding um, of our work. And again, as Kasike mentioned, it reconfirmed what people have known through their traditions, through their oral history, um, that the indigenous ancestry in the Caribbean um, still exists um, in people today. Um, so thank you. Uh, that is it for me. Thank you, Dr. Sirak. Um, we will have questions after Dr. Ben Torres. So if there's anybody who has questions to ask, please note them and um, we can tackle all of these exciting issues that were raised in Dr. Sirak's presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sirak. Um, Dr. Ben Torres. Well, thank you, Dr. Sirak. That was an amazing talk. Um, beautiful, beautiful slides. Very well done. I have a lot of questions and look forward to engaging with you after we're um, I'm, I'm done presenting. Um, so I, I kind of want to pick up um, and take things in a slightly different direction uh, that Dr. Sirak did. Uh, definitely complimentary. Uh, but what I really want to focus on is what can DNA tell us about our past? Most of my work, I've really focused on working with um, living communities and being able to incorporate ancient DNA will definitely add uh, to some of the stories and, and things that we can learn um, about our past. But I think it's particularly uh, important to think about how the present uh, and the past connect, whether we're talking about material culture or whether we're, we're thinking about uh, DNA. So in 2000, in three, the scientific community really triumphed uh, in the completion of the first multinational effort to sequence the human genome. The work really marked a change in the way in which genetic data was harnessed to learn about human experience. And anthropologists in particular and other scientists uh, could now consider other types of information beyond individual idiosyncrasies or medically relevant traits. Uh, these things were now available to learn more about human history. What could we learn uh, about about our past. With ancient DNA, um, as Dr. Dr. Sirak um, illustrated, it, and as, as, as I'll mention here, it offers really new ways to think about the past, to be able to address questions um, that previously uh, we haven't been able to, uh, to address. Um, I would caution, however, uh, that genetics and genetic technologies are, are tools, okay? and these are tools that have to be carefully implemented. Um, as, as mentioned uh, a bit in, in some of uh, Dr. Sirak's presentation um, and actually some of the work uh, that she's involved in, doing ancient DNA work is, is oftentimes inherently a destructive process. Okay? One of the first steps in order to get the DNA out of bone is that you have to grind the bone, you have to destroy the bone, which means this is not material that you can return uh, to, to the community. There are technologies um, in place now where they're a little bit less invasive, um, but given some of the complications of recovering authentic DNA, they're not always appropriate to use. Uh, so all, more often than not, you have to destroy the bone in order uh, to extract the DNA. So in this very busy slide, I've kind of um, shows a schematic of how um, ancient DNA work uh, is, is done. Um, irregardless, because the past and the present are connected, uh, we do have to think about how doing this, using these technologies uh, can affect stakeholder communities. So it goes well beyond uh, just, just the technology. In terms of my work um, and using genetic uh, technologies in living populations and applying some of these questions to, to uh, address questions about the past, there's a variety of things uh, that we can learn. Uh, which are particularly uh, appropriate uh, for archaeological anthropology. So using DNA, we might be interested in learning more uh, about an individual's, um, individual's past, right? So we can learn uh, more about the geographic origins within biological context. So some of this can complement some of the uh, chemical work or uh, uh, radiographic work that can be done on, 
um, bioarchaeological materials. Uh, we can also use these technologies to identify uh, genetic kin, right? So use DNA to connect uh, people, sometimes living and dead, uh, to, uh, to, to questions having to do with the past uh, and the present. We can also take a population uh, perspective. Um, in this case, we can think about using DNA uh, in ways that will illustrate the migratory history um, of, of different populations. We can go much further back in time and talk about the common ancestry of all people um, and learn how we've moved across as a species moved across the globe. We can also increasingly ask questions about health and disease, um, not only in an ancient context, but also in a modern uh, context. Increasingly, we're seeing studies uh, where people are able to successfully extract uh, like ancient pathogens and they could tell us about the evolution of these pathogens and how this varies um, in relation to uh, human, human activity. So very briefly want to talk about uh, how we might or actually how I've used uh, genetic techniques um, in, in my own work and then how that's complementary uh, to archaeology and some of the questions about uh, different Caribbean communities. So very briefly when we do uh, ancestry testing there's different parts of the genome that we look at. Uh, we can be interested in looking first at these uniparental tests. So these are parts of the genome that you inherit um, from, from one parent. So if we're interested in the maternal lineage, for example, we'll focus on mitochondrial DNA. In the schematic here, this is represented by the circle, and you'll see that this circle is inherited by the son and daughters as well. Um, and they, it is generally inherited unchanged from um, the mother. Uh, so in this uh, image, we see this, this uh, man has inherited his mitochondrial DNA from his mother who got it from her mother and from her, her mother um, so, and so on. So this is something that we could look at to look at just the uh, maternal line. Um, in men, we can focus on the Y chromosome. The Y chromosome contains the necessary uh, genetic material for uh, making men chromosomally male. Um, and this is inherited through the father's line. So again, in these sorts of studies, if we look at the mitochondrial or the Y chromosome, we're gonna learn either about the mitochondrial, the maternal line or the paternal line respectively. We do have another uh, series of tests where we can get a uh, look at sort of all of, all of the DNA, um, get a more general, general picture and that's autosomal DNA and that's, that's biparentally uh, inherited. With our mitochondrial and uh, Y chromosome tests, as I mentioned, these are uniparental um, and it comes, uh, mitochondrial DNA is inherited from the mother. Everybody has it, but again, you just get it from your mother. In our, test, in our um, studies, we'll, look, we'll use this to say something about uh, female me me mediated migration, for example, or uh, general sort of ancestry uh, along the maternal line. Another unique feature uh, about mitochondrial DNA um, is that they have these similarities uh, that, that allow us to group them into these genetic families that we call haplogroups. Okay. So pictured here is kind of an older, an older version um, of these haplogroups or these, these genetic families. And what you'll notice sort of right off is that they're generally, and I, there's some wiggle room in here, but they're generally continentally specific. So if an individual has, um, belongs to let's say haplogroup L1, we would say that they have, oh, excuse me, ancestry uh, among sub-Saharan Africans. Okay. So that's using these uh, genetic families. We can do similar things with uh, the Y chromosome. So as I mentioned, uh, this is inherited unchanged from um, father to son. Um, and again, tells us something about uh, the paternal, paternal ancestry. Like mitochondrial DNA, we can uh, assign uh, these different Y chromosome um, changes to these general families that we call haplogroups. Uh, so in uh, a lot of work, you'll see uh, this used to talk about the ancestry along the paternal lineage. So in the Americas, you'll notice uh, that there's a haplogroup, it's actually called QM3, um, that's quite prominent um, among um, indigenous um, communities uh, in the Americas. So looking, uh, looking for this particular genetic family, this haplogroup can be indicative of, uh, of ancestry. And I had mentioned uh, looking at a third region uh, of the DNA. So this would be ancestry uh, that you get from both sides of your family. Okay, I'm kind of simplifying and um, moving over this pretty, pretty, um, pretty briefly. Um, but this provides an overall estimate of an individual's ancestry. So it can tell you a little bit uh, of, of where uh, the majority of your ancestors uh, have come from. And, and this um, can be 
depicted in a variety uh, of ways. So in this image, for example, this individual has a lot of ancestry from across Africa um, and to a smaller extent, Europe is represented in the blue um, and then um, likely, likely the Americas uh, represented in the sort of orange and, and yellow. The way that we get uh, these autosomal ancestry tests are using something known as ancestry informative markers. Okay, so these are genetic markers that vary in frequency across uh, the world's uh, populations. So for example, if we look at FY null, this uh, actually codes for uh, a protein on the surface of the red blood cell. Interestingly enough, this particular protein um, for uh, on the red blood cell is something that one of the malaria parasites can use uh, to gain entry into the cell. So as a genetic adaptation in parts of the world where malaria uh, is, is uh, common, uh, people have made these genetic adaptations where they no longer produce uh, that particular marker. Okay? So what we see this, we see this kind of represented here where the frequency of this particular marker is very low um, in, in, in some African groups um, and nearly uh, at fixation in other parts of the world where malaria is not as endemic. So we can use many, many markers like this. Um, initially, when these sorts of tests started, people were using 60, maybe 100. Now, when we do these sorts of tests, we're using upwards of a million uh, of these types of markers um, and then uh, can statistically assess how related a person is uh, to two different reference groups. With these ancestry tests, whether you're taking them commercially or you're using them in an academic setting, there are some really important caveats to keep in mind while you're interpreting um, the, the results. So the first thing is that those uniparental tests, the mitochondrial DNA or the Y chromosome, they're really only informative about one lineage. Okay, so if we're talking about mitochondrial DNA, you're only gonna see uh, the mother's lineage. All of these other parts um, of the a person's genealogy or genetic genealogy, it's blind to it. And the same thing with, with the Y chromosome. Okay, the Y chromosome, you're just gonna fo focus on that paternal lineage uh, the general overall ancestry of the individual is blinded to this, this sort of, of test. In addition, these ancestry tests, again, whether we're using them in a commercial setting or context or more of an academic setting, it's hugely dependent on the reference populations uh, that we have. So when we do these, uh, these sort of ancestry tests or create these ancestry estimations, um, what we're doing is we are looking at these ancestry informative markers in our test takers and we're comparing them to reference groups. If your reference groups are inappropriately defined or you know, really don't make sense for the, for the part of the world that you're looking at, you will definitely get a number. Okay? You will get an ancestry estimate, but it will be no good. Um, in the context of direct to consumer tests, periodically uh, test takers will get updated results where their ancestry estimates have changed. Um, and what's going on there is it's not an indication that there's a problem with these tests, um, but in fact, these companies are updating their reference populations, and that causes the estimates uh, to change. From an academic perspective, I, well, actually, I, I'll take that back. I would say just anyone who, who is using um, ancestry tests, whether it's in a commercial setting or an academic context, there is an issue of how do we depict, uh, appropriately depict ancestry estimations. Oftentimes, uh, these are retur returned as percentages, so X percentage ancestry from you know, Africa or from Europe. And people tend to be too fixated um, on that number. And it does, it harkens to these ideas of blood quantums and things uh, are ideas that, that, that aren't necessarily appropriate uh, for thinking about human variation and, and relatedness to one another. So the, these are the sorts of caveats that are, are quite important uh, when we think about implementing uh, these types of technologies. Before I move into some of the work that I've done, I do want to point out um, this point, this relationship between race um, and genetic ancestry estimation. Okay? Um, you will see a variety of, of responses to how people think about um, the relationship of, of uh, genetics um, and race. As a social scientist, um, I, I will always uh, say and, and advocate that race is, is experiential and it's constructed. Okay? Genetic ancestry, um, on the other hand, can be informative about our ancestors, but not necessarily tell us about our race. You could look at somebody's genetic ancestry and you know, make a guess about how they might identify racially, but it doesn't necessarily um, indicate how they will identify. 
In addition, uh, you can also think about a person's, you know, their genetic ancestry, particularly those from the Caribbean, where we know there's a history of admixture. There are going to be people in your family tree who would identify racially differently um, than you would. So this is an important caveat to, to kind of um, be very clear uh, about what genetic ancestry can tell you. It cannot tell you anything about your race. It can tell you about the geographic, biogeographic uh, origins of, of some of your ancestors. So moving into some of the work that I've uh, done, particularly um, in addressing this question about the potential uh, for indigenous uh, American or Caribbean um, admixture with African peoples. Um, some of my earliest work, I did genetic surveys across the lesser, the islands of the Lesser Antilles. In that work, I was particularly focused on those who identified as uh, African descendants. At this time, I was interested in addressing questions about uh, where um, in Africa people were taken from. As part of that work, I became increasingly aware uh, that there was a lot of potential um, for indigenous and Caribbean people uh, to have mixed. And these would be things that would be outside of the purview of European chroniclers. So these aren't things that are written down um, in, in books. Okay? Uh, this is something that now exists in oral, or has actually has always existed in, in the oral histories of various communities and is also um, illustrated uh, in the DNA of, of different people. Okay. So in my most recent project, um, I'm working again with, with my husband who's a uh, cultural anthropologist, um, but we're working with a community center uh, in Puerto Rico, but specifically with people who identify uh, as Afro-Puerto Rican. And we don't have time to go into it today, uh, but even identifying as Afro-Puerto Rican, in that case, even identifying as Taino or indigenous, these are political statements. And a lot of this has to do uh, with the history um, of of Puerto Rico and, and the Caribbean uh, more broadly. So in this work, we're looking at um, genetic ancestry and Afro-Puerto Ricans, um, and we're doing some ethnographic work to understand how they understand uh, their own identities uh, and movement throughout, uh, throughout the island. From a genetic perspective, I am interested in the potential um, for uh, indigenous and Caribbean uh, admixture, as well as the relationships uh, of uh, both African descendants and indigenous descendants um, within uh, Puerto Rico and throughout some of the other, the other islands. In another project uh, that I completed in uh, St. Vincent um, uh, and uh, Trinidad, I worked with indigenous communities to learn more about uh, peopling of, of the Caribbean. So I worked with the first people's community uh, of Arima in Trinidad, as well as the Garifuna uh, in St. Vincent. I have the, the publications are, are pictured uh, there. Uh, but in doing this work, we learned more about uh, the genetic legacies uh, of both African and indigenous Caribbean peoples and how that's reflected uh, in these communities uh, today. And we've, we've seen some kind of interesting patterns um, that suggest similarities in overall history, um, but also that each island has uh, its own unique history and that is reflected in their, in their DNA. Of most relevance to today, I've also done a project uh, with the Akompong Town uh, Maroons. So in this work, um, I, I actually took my whole family and, and we lived in a Kampong town um, for, uh, for a few months during the summer and I made subsequent uh, trips and, and stays um, and, and, and stayed in a Kampong town. Um, but in this study, I was interested in learning about uh, what Maroons had to say about their own ancestry. And I'd, I'd read um, histories written by community members indicating that the, some of the very first Maroons were actually indigenous people. And again, from a logical standpoint, this makes sense uh, that uh, Africans or African descendants would be able to interact and learn from and engage uh, with indigenous knowledge to figure out how to survive so well uh, to the point that they actually um, took on the British uh, to, to win their independence. But it would make sense that there was some interaction, right? How else are you going to know about the flora and the fauna and what's safe and, and what's not safe to eat uh, and how to live, uh, but without relying on the people who were there first. So in this particular study, um, it was a kind of a small study, but I was able uh, to detect, detect indigenous ancestry along uh, the maternal lineages um, in just 50 uh, people um, from uh, a Kampong town, Maroon, um, from, from a Kampong town. Prior to some of that work, as I mentioned, um, I had started with a, a genetic survey uh, that looked at ancestry across uh, the Caribbean. And as I mentioned in that work, I was really focused on learning more about the African origins of um, 
African descendants throughout these islands. But in doing that work, um, I saw a few interesting uh, patterns. So what I'm depicting here are different ancestry estimates. So you can read these as percentages. So these are general ancestry estimates, 77.2% ancestry uh, attributed to uh, Africa, um, the Americas, and then Europe. So I have highlighted here, uh, these are samples from Jamaica. These are actually samples that were provided by a collaborator uh, for me. Uh, but what you can see um, is that there's a lot of African ancestry in, in the people who were, um, were sampled, um, as well as some you know, substantial amount of European ancestry. Okay, we understand that that kind of makes sense. What was surprising to me, however, uh, was the amount of islands that had substantial amounts of indigenous ancestry. You'll see uh, Dominica, okay, where there we know that there is a, a very long continuous history of indigenous populations and there's a reserve, the Kalinago Reserve um, on a large segment of the island. But the ancestry, even in people who identify as uh, African descendants, it's pretty high uh, in, in Dominica. In St. Kitts, it's not as high among African descendants, um, but uh, regardless, it, it is actually uh, there. When I did this work, uh, again, I was really um, interested in, in the aspect of uh, African origins and learning more uh, about where people came from. Uh, but this has intrigued me as well, the indigenous ancestry. Uh, in addition, um, there have been a variety of movements in the last decade uh, where people are increasingly claiming their indigenous uh, ancestry. Uh, again, I don't have time to go into it, but I have some really e interesting ethnographic data uh, out of uh, St. Vincent uh, among the Garifuna uh, about this, this process of reclaiming uh, and, and pride in their indigenous, uh, indigenous ancestry. So in terms of thinking about uh, genetic data, uh, I would never set out to do a project to prove uh, who is indigenous and who's not. That is, that is not what um, genetic data can tell us. What it can do is can be a testament, right, to uh, the continuity that existed and exists uh, in these island communities. I also think that genetics potentially play a really strong role in breaking down and dispelling some of these myths that indigenous populations um, are, are all gone. Um, I've written about this uh, in ex uh, kind of in a longer format in a, in a paper that I published in uh, 2014. Um, and the, the broad point uh, that I want to make, uh, or that I made with this paper, uh, was that DNA doesn't necessarily make things easier. In fact, it adds a bit of a layer of complexity because these, uh, the DNA has to be interpreted within the historical, political, and economic context in which they exist. And this is actually different from island to island. Okay. So there's no panacea, uh, but instead this is all sort of a, a dynamic process uh, in which uh, stakeholder communities have to be involved um, in, in how uh, DNA, uh, archaeological information, for example, is, uh, is used. Okay. And with that, I'm pretty certain I'm out of time, um, but there are always um, people to thank. But first and foremost, I always thank my study participants, uh, as well as my collaborators and those who pay the bills. So uh, College of Arts and Sciences and the Office of Equity and Diversity. So with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ben Torres. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. I am really touched by one of the things that you said. Um, you said testament to the continuity that exists in these islands. And I'm also very happy that um, Dr. Sirak also mentioned the genocide, which some people still to this day um, will not accept that existed in the region during the contact period. But regardless of those horrific events, there is still evidence that the indigenous people of the, re the region survived. Um, these were two very informative and exciting presentations based on the amount of work that has been dedicated by the researchers and also the potential you know, for us in the region and also for us in Jamaica in understanding our development and the history of the people. I am, um, it's, it's funny that in, in, in thinking about Dr. Sirak's presentation, um, especially when she highlighted the two main questions of the research, which one of it is the geographic origins. 
and their exploration of archaic populations and ceramic populations and also about estimations about population size and um, the level of interaction. I, I am not really that surprised um, because uh, some of this, the theories that have presented have always reflected a connection to Central and South America. Um, it of course highlights that you have to be careful how you choose to classify people and that you can't just classify people on one type of evidence that remains because ceramics and um, stone tools, although they may survive, are just one part of the range of people's cultural expression. With regards to the issue about island mobility, I am an islander. I am naturally curious. You're curious about exploring your world and the world around you. And some view the sea as being a, a factor that would limit exploration. But to an islander, the sea is just another means of connection. So I was, I was very excited to see about the high level of, of interconnectivity that existed and the, the distribution of possible kingships um, that was highlighted in this project. And then of course, this discussion about our, you know, how many of the indigenous populations and that we should temper our estimations of what the size of these populations were. But I, I think it has, it has never been an issue where people thought that, for example, Las Cascas numbers were accurate. I think you always view that there may be some overcalculations due to the agenda um, that was being promoted. And at the same time, I don't know how many of you know about Morales Padron, but he did a, a study in 1952 called Spanish Jamaica. 52 is the Spanish version. There's an English version that was translated by Professor Patrick Brown um, that was published by the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. So if you can get a copy in the early 2000s, you can read it. So Las Cascas estimates for like islands of like Jamaica was like 600,000 indigenous peoples. But yet Morales Padron at that time in the 1950s said that he did not agree with those figures and that he felt a more reasonable estimation would have been about 60,000. So um, I'm really excited to see um, that Dr. Cedric, I'm sorry, Dr. Sirat's um, contributions with her fellow researchers are definitely confirming and contradicting a lot of these theories and speculations. And as you know, with research, you can only speculate on what is evident at the time. And that is why it is so important to continuously be researching and contributing new data for current and future researchers to explore. Well, I was very excited about Dr. Ben Torres. I mean, I, I'm totally fan fan girling. Um, I am, um, I, I, it's, it's more personal for me because I'm of Maroon ancestry. So I'm, I'm very, I know her work in Jamaica has been of uh, the Akopong um, um, town in St. Elizabeth. So I'm, I'm hoping that she will come and she will work with the Windward Maroons, especially in the Blue and Jonka Mountain region. You know, and if you, if you ever need a guinea pig, I'm always available. Um, and you, you, had, you touched on a lot of potential that um, genetic ancestry is, but there's also a point that I, I, I want to highlight that you said when you talked about race and genetic ancestry. And when you said that this provides, genetic ancestry provides information about our ancestors, not necessarily race, right? Um, because a lot of people get preoccupied with these racial classifications, which are constructs, right? And the truth of the matter is how somebody chooses to identify racially is a personal, is a personal uh, um, choice because you can be 31, 32, 31 or 32% of you is, um, is 
is, sorry, 31 or over 32 may be African, and only one out of 32 may be Native American, and you choose to identify as an indigenous person uh, because that is your choice. Um, I am phenotypically African, but I identify as indigenous also. Um, my Taino name is Boyanani Zak, so I forgive you. <laughs> All right, and I and I like the fact that you touched on because kits like Ancestry and Twenty Three and Me are becoming very very popular, and a, a number of Jamaicans I am aware of have used these kits to explore their geographic heritage, and for some they're results have been startling, especially the Native American components. So I'm glad you explained about all the different ways and approaches that they're used to um, highlight, focusing, of course, on the importance of um, mitochondrial DNA and um, these autosomal tests. Um, you mentioned the need for reference population and that the work is as successful as the reference populations. And one of the questions that I really would like to ask after I, I open the floor for question is in what ways can we do to improve these reference um, populations so that we can get more accurate um, results. Um, thank you for showcasing your work on especially the Garifuna of St. Vincent. Very limited work is done on the Garifuna. And, um, and they are also people who have indigenous and African ties along with the Maroons. And there are other groups that exist. And also your work in, um, in Puerto Rico on the African Puerto Ricans. They are Black Latinos. It's very hard when you're trying to find that teaching Latin American art though, but they are Black Latinos. Um, and particularly, I was surprised when you were showing the admixtures for each island that for somewhere like Jamaica, you had incidents of amongst the Native American, a maximum of 77% in one, I'm assuming that's one person. And of course, a minimum of 1.4, because I must say, I would never have imagined that we would have had people here with as much as 77%. I mean, I, I, I can get 10%, so forgive my ignorance. So um, ladies, thank you so much for your contributions and I am I'm looking forward to more of your work and I would, um, on behalf of the society, thank you for making these presentations to, to us today. And I would like to open the floor because I'm sure you're, you know, you're going to be absolutely bombarded with questions. Thank you, Dr. Leslie Gail Atkinson. Uh, looks like we've got some questions going on in the chat. Uh, Wendy, let me know, and you've got some compliments going on in the chat. Great to see my, my current student, Laura Lee Martin, uh, uh, benefiting from this discussion. Wendy, do you want me to repeat your question or do you wanna take over the mic and add add any further information to this. And this is Wendy Lee, uh, Dr. James Lee's uh, daughter. Dr. James Lee was the founder of the Archaeological Society of Jamaica. So I had to, I had to make that point clear, Wendy. Uh, I'm happy to read your question though, Wendy, but perhaps you want to uh, ask it over the mic. Yes, I was just curious because you see the, the Cuban populations are just so distinct from the others. So I did, I'm gonna read it again, Zach. Yeah, so th this this idea that archaic population so prevalent in Cuba compared to other islands, and as, as Wendy knows, and I know her, her son Simon is working on this issue right now, Jamaica is really a mystery as it relates to archaic population. I know uh, uh, Leslie can, can speak to that also. So perhaps uh, Dr. Sirach, you can, provide us with a bit more information about this, this archaic wave, at least yeah. genetically. Yeah. Sure, sure. Wendy is exactly right um, in that we can't really necessarily directly place the origin of the archaic associated people in the Caribbean yet. 
we can get close and say that it's probably in Central or South America, and it's probably from a very deeply diverged um, indigenous population, but we're not able to particularly place it yet. Um, what Wendy said about Cuba is exactly correct. Um, there was a, a very distinct and notable um, archaic presence on Cuba. Um, actually, interestingly, one of the, the coolest findings in this paper that we published was that in the western part of Cuba, um, at the site of Canemar Abajo, um, the archaic associated ancestry that we saw actually existed unadmixed well into the ceramic uh, period. So there were ceramic users living uh, in parallel with these um, archaic associated people, um, but there was no intermixing going on that we can tell from our data. Um, and apparently in the historical record, there's some um, indication that uh, at the time of European colonization, there was a, a population living in the Western part of Cuba that spoke a different language and, and had a different culture overall. Um, and so we have reason to believe that this um, archaic associated community actually was um, an independent and um, fairly isolated group uh, very late in, in history. Uh, I need to unmute. So interesting. Yeah, and thank you, Wendy, for that question. Thank you, Dr. Sirak, for the, for the response. I mean, it is interesting, right? I mean, at least how we, we currently teach and uh, the research information as it relates to archaic populations that different material cultures, different regions from Central to South America, but it sounds like you may be dealing with biologically similar, if not uh, uh, within populations that perhaps are doing things a bit differently, but I, I do look forward to, to more work so we can really hit home those 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 origin points. Uh, another question from our immediate past president, Dr. Susan Francis Brown, uh, for, for Dr. Ben Torres. Uh, in relation to the admixture data, was this for a specific maroon population or, or a more general general population? So for the uh, last slide that I showed that had the, the large table, that was a more general population. Um, I do have the study that was specifically um, on a Kumpong town uh, maroons, but that table uh, was a more generalized sort of the general population. Um, and again, that data came from a, a collaborator. So I don't have um, the sort of ethnographic aspect of who they were, where they came from. Um, but it, it is quite remarkable to see that there are some people with high, high amounts of indigenous ancestry. Um, so it would be more interesting to kind of dig deeper in that uh, sample more widely and also collect the, the oral stories and the, and the ethnography surrounding, surrounding that. Thank you, Dr. Ben Torres. I see uh, Dr. Francis Brown, by all means, take over the mic if you can. I see your hand up, would love to hear from you. Um, thanks, Zach. I just wondered, uh, you know, one of the things that we, we've traditionally had in Jamaica in certain areas is this um, conviction among, among many persons that there, they do have Taino ancestry. You know, in, in my own case, in my, my mother's um, great grandmother was um, traditionally, there is this talk that, you know, she had straight, coarse black hair and therefore she was probably an Arawak as we defined it at the time. And there are so many other um, persons who I can think of with similar, with similar situations. And of course, the, the more recent development of the, the more formalized Taino um, communities or, or um, um, you know, persons acknowledgement as Tainos, uh, I think really, really in a sense comes out of and builds on that. And I just wonder for both Dr. Sirak and Dr. Ben Torres, what is your sense of the information that exists and, and where we can go in terms of, um, in terms of filling some of the gaps uh, as it relates to the, the actuality, the reality of the Taino presence in our society. The, the, I think a lot of people have grown up feeling that the Tainos were this small part of, of our, um, our cultural, um, our past, our, our cultural history. And I think people are, are coming to realize that there is so much more there, both in the archeological record than is actually displayed. 
and also in coming out of DNA and so on. So I'm just wondering if you if you have any any sense that that eight point uh, thing percent I think it is Dr. Bentor is that you mentioned. You know, do do you have any sense of of what that actually means in terms of the the reality of the Taino presence as it as it might have um, stuck around in Jamaica over the over the generations and over the centuries. Um, I, as I as I look at the data, I think um, that it's indicative that we need to do more work, um, more sort of more research, sample broadly. Uh, these are interesting times that we live in. Um, socially, the cost as uh, to identify in a particular way, particularly as uh, as as Taino or, or, or as Indigenous, it's a lot less than it used to be. Um, so I think this offers really interesting opportunities for people who know they have this ancestry uh, to somehow become engaged and involved in, in this sort of work and learning about their, um, their past. That being said, um, I am also very, uh, want to tell people to be very cautious about how their uh, genetic information is used, uh, particularly for communities that have been um, minoritized and marginalized. The last thing I would want as a researcher would be something that I worked on, um, data that I generated to be used against these communities, to be used to, to further marginalize these communities. So I think that if this work is to go on, it has to uh, emanate from the community um, and it has to be a true in, uh, engagement, collaboration uh, with, with researchers. And it is my hope uh, that we will see researchers that genetic anthropological work will be done at the University of West Indies and that there will be local scholars who can do this work and sort of lead this, lead the efforts to collaborate um, within the island, across the islands, and then of course with, with researchers in the, in the US. Uh, I think there's just more, there should be more opportunity um, now to do this work uh, because the social costs uh, of, of, of identifying in a particular way uh, are, are less. And as I mentioned, uh, in uh, Puerto Rico, even I identifying as Afro-Puerto Rican, it's a political statement. Identifying with one particular ancestry, these are all political statements. These are things that have to be kept in mind uh, as we ask these, these sorts of questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ben Torres. I'm going to go straight back to you from our distinguished chair, Dr. Uh, Leslie Gale Atkinson Swaby. Could you talk more about efforts that we can implement to improve uh, reference uh, populations? And I think you essentially just alluded to that, but more work needs to be done. What is, what is that work? Uh, you know, in an ideal world, um, it, it would be great uh, to have um, analogs to, to Dr. Sorak and me, but in at, at UWE or at various other uh, institutions in the Caribbean uh, who are invested in the communities in ways that you I, I can't necessarily be because I'm not located there. Um, what we what ideally we need to see is just uh, a broader sampling um, going into those regions of, of the different islands uh, that have been overlooked historically. Um, I in the past have tried to, to work with um, uh, the indigenous community in Dominica. Uh, and, you know, th there would be a lot to be learned, a lot that could be said uh, about both the present and the past. But at the time I asked, the community was not interested. And uh, understandably so, there'd, you know, long, there'd been a long history of scientific abuses. Um, so I think uh, it would be wonderful if we could start to amend that. One way of doing that is incorporating um, local people into this work. Um, and then again, to sample broadly, to, to, to try and get at uh, the aspects of history that weren't written down because they were outside of the purview of, of, of various chroniclers. Thank you, Dr. Ben Torres. I was so impressed to hear about you and your families, uh, uh, the time actually boots on the ground living in uh, Akhompong. I think that is a quite a different approach than, than perhaps scientists, DNA scientists have have demonstrated before. So thank you for, for sharing that. And I think that's a, a, a clear model moving forward. Uh, Dr. Sorak, I think I'll hit you with the same question because I know you're probably within a lab right now that not only focused on, on, on the Caribbean, but focused globally alongside uh, Dr. David Reich's, Reich's uh, Human Atlas, I think, and maybe you can talk more about that because that sounds like one of these broad projects that will acquire a more what representative uh, reference collection, perhaps. But uh, I'll let you speak to that. 
Yeah, I mean, the goal of science, of scientific researchers, you know, is to, to gather as much data as possible um, and to build these, these reference data sets that we can use to create more context. And every single data point that we generate um, can be used in the future to better contextualize new data. And it builds and it builds and it builds. And so that's the goal of a lot of what we're doing in this lab. Um, all the data that we generate that becomes published uh, is then used in the future in the background uh, to help with new data, to help understand new data. Um, that being said, um, something something that uh, Dr. Ventura said is 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 really resounding. You know, th that's a scientific goal, but you also have to approach this work as a uh, steward for anthropological remains and as someone who recognizes that those remains may have living descendants. Um, and that's something really important that we also need to consider. So uh, she expressed that, you know, she, she wanted to work with this community and they, they weren't interested in working with her. And as a researcher, that's disappointing, but as a person, as a human, um, as, as a good soul, that's, that's fine. And you take no for an answer. It's the same situation working with ancient remains. Um, they deserve sensitivity and respect, and there are living people who feel, who believe that they 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 can speak on their behalf, and that's something that we need to um, absolutely first and foremost um, respect in our work as well. So uh, a lot of the work we're doing is um, trying to uh, do exactly exactly what Dr. Ventura said is is identify analogs in different places, people who we can work with, collaborators on the grounds, um, and find ways to meaningfully involve them in the work, um, do sort of capacity building and education when it's possible and appropriate, and um, not only bring academic audiences on board, but also uh, stakeholder groups um, who may not be from academic backgrounds. So it's not a simple uh, process of data generation, but it's a very holistic process of understanding um, the situation around the data that you would like to study. Thank you for that. And that, look, one of the questions I had, but you, I'm looking at the chat now, you essentially responded to it, has to do with how do you share? I mean, we sit through a presentation like this and without backgrounds in molecular biology, this can be some hard information to, to process, right? I, so I was thinking, how do you, how do you get this out to, to uh, wider audiences study populations, children, but then you sent that link to, uh, it, it looks like a guide covering your recent research for specifically for children. And that I, I commend you for that effort. I, I, I imagine there's, there's other strategies you all are using, but this is so what I, I thought was so important about uh, Leslie's book that came out within two years ago, being able to talk about these important uh, human legacies in a way that that inspires and motivates the next generation. So thank you for that. I, I and I also see uh, Dr. Sirach, you've been active in the chat, but I would like you to speak more to the question posed by our, our board member, Angelique Mullings, uh, finding related individuals in Dominican Republic. I know Angelique before this whole COVID stuff was supposed to go to Dominican Republic and work alongside Corinne Hoffman on some archeology span there. So I, I know she's interested in this. Uh, how closely were these individuals related? Uh, uh, yeah, any more information that you can provide us there? We're hoping to see some of those relationships right here in Jamaica. Yeah, definitely. Um, we can look at the, the rate at which you share your genetic information with other people. And we basically compare an individual's genetic data and to see how much how similar it is to every other individual um, in the data set uh, because we learned that people don't only share data share relationships with individuals who are buried at what we would consider to be their same site but you know these sites in the past may have been very very deeply connected um, so the specific uh, question for the Dominican Republic was we found a father and son who were buried at one site and they had a relative who was the second degree relative of the father and therefore the third degree relative of the son um, buried around 75 kilometers apart. So we can identify close relatives anywhere from, we published on identical twins even. Um, so anywhere from very, very closely genetic related, we have a lot of families in our data set. Um, so I'm looking at a family right now from Colombia, a mother, father, 
and their child and their child's child. So that's really interesting. Um, and then we could identify people who are as, as distant as fifth to eighth degree relatives. So, you know, if you've done 23andMe, you probably see these family connections and you have no idea who these people are, um, but they share a very, very small proportion of genetic data with you um, from a distant ancestor. So we can uh, explore all different levels and that really helps bring some life um, to these, these analyses, especially when you have things like uh, an, an archaeological uh, record of how the individuals were buried and maybe in what positions and in what proximity to each other. Um, it helps us understand, you know, what might have been a determining factor if family was a determining factor of burial patterns in the past. And for, for a site like White Marl here in Jamaica with, with such a, a robust burial data set, that, that, I mean, the potential is just amazing to be able to, like you just said, enhance our ability to tell these human stories. And that, that takes me to our next point. And I know uh, the cacique left, but I think his, his praise to you both really speaks to the, the power of these studies and the ability to combine multiple data sets. He was previously part of the language symposium celebrating indigenous mother languages, mentioned by the linguists, the benefits of cross-faculty collaboration. Again, especially some of the work that we heard Dr. Ben Torres refer to really is relying on this multiple uh, evidential uh, approach. Uh, so I, I thought that was a, a really good point on how we can uh, combine the power of DNA with the power of uh, a variety of other data sources, right? In order to, really uh, 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 provide some, some good human stories, some, some advanced human stories. Uh, uh, hey, and so another issue, uh, Luz Guerrera, and I, I'm sorry if I've, I've butchered uh, names. Uh, we know from the Spanish chroniclers that very early on, 1492 to 1550 at least, the first colonizers in Española, uh, Ayati, Borique, Puerto Rico were actively carrying out slave raids in other islands as well as along South American coasts. Uh, and we'll, we'll open this up for, for both speakers. Do you see your data providing some insight into the admixture that came from earlier interactions, perhaps this for Dr. Sirach, but also the admixtures that were a result of war and enslavement? So I'm gonna yeah. pick on you, Dr. Sirach, yeah. Sure, sure, I actually um, wrote in the chat that that is like, you, like someone's inside my head because that's exactly one of the questions that we want to explore next. I've actually approached Zach about it, I think a, a few weeks ago, maybe. Yeah. Um, but recognizing that there was a huge movement of people um, post contact um, who were taken from the continental Americas and brought into the Caribbean for the purpose of slavery. Um, that's a, that's a, a question we would really like to understand more. And there's a whole field of study that looks at the dynamics of the American slave trade in, in example, in particular, as well as the uh, transatlantic slave trade. And um, so this is absolutely something that we want to um, study. One thing that I think is actually kind of exciting about the work that's been done and the work and where we're going with it is that uh, I've heard people say that, oh, the indigenous ancestry that is in the Caribbean today is um, was introduced after European contact by uh, these post-colonial movements um, related to slavery. And our research showed that that is not the case. And it really confirmed um, oral history uh, and people's people's traditional knowledge that they had connections into the deep past from people who lived in the Caribbean for thousands of years. Um, so we can unequivocally say that the indigenous ancestry in the Caribbean today is not solely a result of post-contact slave movements, um, but it, it has very, very, very deep roots. So this is a second question to study. And um, we have actually started to look into this um, with with collaborators throughout the Caribbean, um, in Barbados, in Jamaica, um, and and in Stacia, a lot of other places. Um, so stay tuned. Hopefully, that will be something um, that is is out within you know within a reasonable amount of time. Thank you, Dr. Sirach, and I'll I'll have you just repeat some information. I think. And look, as someone who's who hasn't been able to travel over the, the last year or more to see my family, uh, the idea of family spread across the region, being able to identify that genetically, 
archaeolo archaeologically, I think is, is just in incredibly potent. Uh, can you speak to beyond DR uh, uh, evidence for, for mobility across islands and specifically wide kin networks? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was one of the new methods that was applied for the first time ever in this paper, and we're going to be applying it to almost everything going forward. Um, but what we do here is we look for um, small segments of shared DNA. So not, not that you might share with a sibling or an aunt uncle, something you might share with a distant relative. Um, and what we found, I actually just pulled up the table to look at it right now, is that we had individuals who were uh, found as far apart as the Bahamas and the Dominican Republic. Here's someone from the Bahamas and Puerto Rico, um, the Bahamas and Cuba. So we have evidence that there were people who were distantly related, but living in, in vastly different parts of the Caribbean. Um, this is indicative of a few things. One is a general smallish population size overall. So very akin to what Leslie said that, you know, um, probably in the order of tens of thousands as opposed to hundreds of thousands or millions. Um, and it's also, also a testament to connectivity and mobility and kind of the dynamic nature of the Caribbean. Um, prior to, to European colonization, people were traveling, they were exploring, they were building contacts and trade networks. And this is all things that people, people know. And here's just one line of evidence that is also supporting that. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I think this is more of a comment. This is from Mr. Ainsley Enriquez, a longtime member, supporter of the Archaeological Society of Jamaica. Thank you so much, Ainsley, for your, for your attendance today. Uh, and, and, uh, and one of our honorary members, I should say, as well. Uh, I agree with the comments made by Leslie Gale and Suzanne. We need to work on some of the isolated communities as they are almost sure to yield significantly different results, which will lead us to a range of different social and physical settlement understandings, in particular, Moortown and the work by Kofi in Nannytown, which really does seem to acknowledge also uh, we have isolated communities in prehistory, ADNA, but also this match matching the approach that, that Dr. Ben Torres took working with contemporary populations. I, I absolutely uh, 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 see what, what Mr. Enriquez is saying and, and hopefully a discussion like this, we can, we can motivate uh, that type of work. Thank you, uh, Ainsley, for raising this issue. Uh, moving forward, yeah, Ruth, and I think this relates to both uh, uh, Dr. Ben Torres and Do Dr. Sirach. What are some ways to remain current on this new research? Uh, and I, I was really pleased to see just the sheer amount of publications that Dr. Ben Torres walked us through. Uh, 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 obviously Kendra's recent co-authored work in nature beyond maybe scientific journals. Uh, this information is available there. What else would you suggest to the audience to, to acquire this type of information that not only scientifically is important, but for many folks personally, personally significant. I, I guess I will um, comment. Actually, before I, I jump and answer that question, I, I think there's some really interesting things that Dr. Sirach said that would also be applicable uh, to other questions um, of interest in the Caribbean. In, in particular, we can use genetic data to um, basically rebuild families uh, that were separated as a result of, of the slave trade when, when you know, children were sold up under uh, a family and sold away. Now we can use DNA to have um, reconnect some of these broader family networks. And even in some of my older studies, kind of low re resolution genetic studies, I actually did see similar uh, mitochondrial lineages across islands, um, even like English speaking islands versus Spanish speaking islands. What it means is they shared a female ancestor. But to be able to think on that level, um, it will kind of help us to challenge sort of these national and, and uh, language barriers that exist um, in, in the Caribbean. So I, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, with regard to staying up on things, I'll take some responsibility. I've been really slow to get on social media. Um, and I, I'm now convinced that it, that it is an appropriate tool, that it's a good tool. Um, so on my end, I, I can do a little bit better. Um, and in sort of putting the work forward. Um, I will also um, say, you know, given, depending on where you are in your career, um, there'll be times where you can actually publish in journals um, that are pu uh, pu published or put forward by uh, different uh, Caribbean publishers. Um, and it, it's, it's a little bit of a complicated uh, 
issue with regard to if you want to keep your job and get tenured here, there are certain journals you need to publish in um, that are not, not necessarily uh, in the Caribbean, but there also can be an effort uh, to engage in those, uh, those, those, those sites and, and publish there as well. Um, ideally, one day when we can all travel and share the same air again, um, attending these conferences, becoming members, members in these uh, different, different uh, Caribbean-based groups will also be ways to uh, publicize this, this work. And of course, collaborating with uh, folks. And it's always hard to do, everybody has their own projects, uh, but these collaborations will be key um, in, in ensuring a, a broader dispersion of, of this research. And Kendra, I know you're on 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 Twitter, uh, but you personally, the lab that you 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 work for. I mean, I as soon as we began our discussion, I went out and got Dr. David Reich's uh, book, 2018, I think. I'm forgetting the title, but it's very catchy, uh, and I, I promise to get through it this this summer. Where can can whether it's individuals interested in following a, a career path that you all are demonstrating right here. Or again, accessing this this information for for personal political uh, reasons. Uh, where, where are some good sources? Where are some good yeah. options for? I I asked this exact same question to to my um, my supervisor in grad school. Like, how do you know what's published? How do you keep up on this? It's it feels like a full time job. Um, I find that social media is actually really good for this. Um, if you find Kind of just the right people who who amplify research that's being published. Um, that's really helpful. People will tweet about good papers. Um, I'm not a huge social media fan. Uh, Twitter is one that I'm trying to embrace more because I think it's a good academic community. Um, I also look on Google Scholar and sometimes I just search ancient DNA and I set my filter to 2021 and I see what's new. Um, and I rely a lot on colleagues. Um, so if you're a part of a community where you can do something like have an email chain uh, where you publish, where you post uh, new papers or a shared Dropbox folder where someone can post any new papers that, that they see, that can be really helpful. Um, I would say the vast majority of papers that I learn about that I want to read are mentioned to me in conversation by colleagues or are shared. We have a lab Slack page where we share new papers. Um, so it's just kind of piecemeal. I don't always get them right when they come out. Um, I hear about them through the grapevine, sometimes weeks or sometimes months or years later. Um, but just trying to build a community of people who want to share research and talk about research, journal clubs. Um, sometimes they have uh, public journal clubs you can go to. Penn State runs one. They run an uh, ancient DNA journal club every Friday that the public can come to. They advertise it on Twitter as well. Um, these can be good ways just to kind of keep up on who's doing what, which is really important, um, you know, to for career building. All right. Uh, I don't want to cut it short, but, uh, you know, regular members of the ASJ, we still have more business to, uh, to, to attend to beginning at one. I know Dr. Ben Torres has to, to run off uh, for, for a one o'clock, and I, I'm sure Dr. Serac has, has other business to attend to as well. But thank you all so much. I do want to uh, let anybody else in the audience, whether raise your hand, post a, a comment, question in the chat, or, or take over the mic. Uh, this we got a few minutes remaining, uh, and so you got one last opportunity, right? But thank you all so much.